Chapter 7 Waking Dreams You had to inform everyone, the mage scolded the dragon, scowling. Kitten nibbled on his breeches. He sighed and scratched the top of her head. But I saw you, in your room, Dane protested, feeling decidedly odd. It was a simulacrum. I'm expressly forbidden to leave the palace. What if their mages came around looking for you? What if the Emperor spies on you? I embodied it with sufficient amounts of my gift to deceive anybody. Should someone try to disrupt the copy, it will enclose the room completely, so no one will enter until I am back inside. And if you're caught, she demanded, he'd love to catch you breaking the rules. Dane, we had to talk. The voice, surprisingly, was Kadar's. There's no other way we can do it without being spied on. Dane faced him and Lyndall. They watched her, not her teacher. You knew he'd be here this morning. That's why you brought me. I also wanted you to see my friends. The kindness in Lyndall's voice broke through her anger. She knew him well enough by now to realize that he was telling the truth. You are more than welcome here in your own right, my dear. She smiled at him reluctantly and nodded. To Numer, she said, You could have trusted me. He took her hands in his. I do trust you, Magelet. I simply didn't wish to discuss it under Osorn's roof. You weren't particularly adept at concealing your state of mind. You would have been visibly apprehensive if I had left with you and His Highness, whether I was invisible or not. Since there was no answer she could make to that, she scowled. How did you get here? Hawk shape. And now, we've little time and much to discuss. Would you mind looking at the aviary for a while? Or would you rather be privy to our discussions? I'll go look at birds, she said hastily. I'm that tired of secrets. Kit, stay or go? Kitten, who loved secrets, shook her head and sat. The iguanas promptly began to climb on her. Wendell opened another door, different from the room with the turtle. Dane entered a large, sunny area with a ceiling that was half glass panes and closed the door behind her. Under the glass and behind a silken barrier net was an aviary. It was different from Osorn's. The plants were northern, not tropical. On the trees, the leaves had turned color and were falling. Something in the room produced a faint chill, like the kind she'd feel at home at this time of year. The air was drier, and the birds who inhabited the aviary were northerners. Lapwings, turtle doves, crested larks, nightingales, song thrushes, and golden green finches. Here's a man who wants to go home, she said to herself, looking at the birds. Of all the pretty southern birds he could have, he picks you. I like his taste. The birds flocked to the netting to peer at her and talk. She chatted with them for some time, listening to them gossip about their neighbors in Lindell. Like the inhabitants of the glass kingdoms next door, these birds had nothing but good to say of the mage. Once each bird had been greeted, she looked at the counter on the far side of the room. Writing materials were scattered over its length, and a number of animal skeletons stood on it, posed as they would have been in life. She also found a large slab of limestone. Embedded in it was an incomplete skeleton, that of a small animal with only three extremely long, bird-like toes to a leg, and a lizard's bony tail. Its skull was odd compared to those of the birds she knew, but its end formed a beak. Most interesting, in the chipped-away stone around it, she saw outlines of what looked like feathered wings. Missing were the lower ribs on the right, part of the spine, the right femur, and the end of the tail. A label on the front of the shallow box contained the limestone red lizard bird, found in the Jalbin quarry, Zalara. Have you ever seen a bird like this, Sec? she asked. No replied the marmoset. Never. After the hollow bone, she wasn't about to touch the complete skeletons. On the other hand, surely there was nothing wrong with touching a collection of bones embedded in rock, particularly if parts of the entire skeleton were missing. Gingerly, she touched a thin claw with her finger. The flash burned into her eyes. Blinking to clear her vision, Dane heard the last thing she wanted to hear in the world, the sound of crumbling rock. First to come free was the skull, followed by the heron-like neck. Next came the overlong arm bones, spine, and bits of ribcage. Pieces moved as if connected, even when they weren't. Outlying chunks of bone jumped from the rock and gathered around the main skeleton as the hip bones separated from their tomb. Look, said Zek, squeaking in excitement. If there's any missing, the bones leave room for it. Wonderful, she whispered. He didn't share his enthusiasm. It made her queasy to look at those absent or invisible chunks. The legs yanked themselves free. 
The skeleton tried to stand and was brought up short, its tail still embedded in limestone. It looked back over its rump to see what the holdup was. The beak opened in a soundless cry that revealed small teeth. It switched its hips, freeing its tail. At liberty, the lizard bird extended its arms, then its legs, having a good stretch after a long nap. Dane sat on a nearby stool, hard. Zek, who couldn't understand why she was not pleased, jumped from her shoulder to the countertop, skidding until he turned and brought himself around. The skeleton was about the size of a crow. It turned to peer at Zek, crouching to get a better look. With eyes that aren't there, Dane said, and giggled helplessly. Both the skeleton and Zek looked at her reproachfully. Sorry. My throat's bless. I didn't know you had the magical assemblage spell, cried Lindell. Numera and Kadar behind him only stared. As if I weren't having enough fun yet, thought Dane. It doesn't seem to matter if pieces are missing. Lindell walked to the counter for a closer look at the creature. But that's why I didn't use the assemblage spell on my own. It doesn't work if the skeleton is incomplete. If it knew it was incomplete, the lizard bird didn't act it. Looking around, it stretched, wagged its arms clumsily, then leaped off the counter. All four humans lunged to catch it, but the skeleton had other ideas. It flew up, bony arms flapping awkwardly, as if it still wore the feathers that had left their imprints in its rock tomb. But there aren't any birds with claws in their arms, Dane protested as the skeleton swooped and turned around the light globe overhead, and its bones are solid, not hollow like a bird's. Bats have sort of fingers, but those are genuine clawed toes, not like a bat's wing. It was no bat. It is a link between the dinosaurs and the hollow bones and animals, birds, alive now, Lindell explained without taking his eyes from the flyer. The seers who look back in time have seen lizard birds in the same era as the largest snake-necked dinosaurs and the lesser tyrant lizards. They have followed the lizard bird's development, and it is true. It comes from the landwalkers. Instead of scales, feathers, said Numer, as interested as Lindell. Also a bird's wishbone and a bird's gripping foot, but it has abdominal ribs as reptiles do, and a flexible tail. The skeleton, tired of exercising invisible wings, settled on Lindell's shoulder. Kadar leaned in to inspect the empty spaces in the bones, and nearly got pecked. Stop that, Lindell ordered, stroking the creature's beak. He was only looking. This isn't the assemblage spell, the prince said, looking at Dane. I've never seen anything like this in my life. What did you do to it? Kitten, who had followed the men, squeaked a reproach at Kadar's tone. The iguanas came in from the other room, prepared to defend Dane. I can't... I'm not... Dane stammered. She looked at Numer, who was rubbing one temple. I think you must explain, he told her. These rooms are warded. Kadar said. That's how I could talk with Master Numer safely. What's in place here is unlike normal warding spells, asked Lindell, leaning against the counter. The lizard bird on his shoulder ran his beak through the mage's fine gray-gold hair, grooming him. The Emperor must never suspect these rooms are warded, or he would come to discover what I have that's worth concealment. If he or his servant mages try to eavesdrop in these rooms, they will hear only dull, innocent conversations and noises made by my animals. Dane whistled. After two years with Numer, she had an idea how complex a spell weave like that would be. It's a new thing that's happened, she told Lindell and Kadar. I'm not sure of the details. Numer, what should I say? All that you told me yesterday, was the quiet reply. She obeyed. When she finished, no one said anything. Waiting for one of them to speak, Dane went to talk to the aviary birds. They wanted reassurance that the bone thing was not going to get into their home. Dane soothed them until they returned to their normal pursuits. The first to speak was Lindell. You mean it isn't permanent? The skeleton, bony tail hooked around the mage's neck, was gnawing his shirt buttons. He'll stop being alive? Dane nodded. I'm sorry, but it does seem to run out after a time. She wanted to add that she wasn't sure if the vulture had run down since the old woman had taken him, but thought the better of it at the last minute. She didn't want to start coughing again. You should try this in the Hall of Bones, the older man remarked, turning the skeleton's head from a necklace he wore under a shirt. Stop that. If you bite it, you'll hurt yourself. Although I suppose it would be a bit inconvenient if any of the dinosaurs were to walk away. Kadar made a face at Dane, who giggled. Inconvenient puts it mildly, the prince drawled. But Dane's right to keep this secret. I hate to think what my uncle would do with someone who has such power. 
Can you imagine? An army of dead creatures that can't be hurt by normal means? Dane thought of the great fused lizards with their plates and spikes of bone and shivered. One of them would do serious harm in a small village. It would be precisely to his taste, agreed Numer. He might decide such power is worth a war in Tortal. Perhaps even all the eastern lands. Well, while he's with us, I'm going to call this one Bone Dancer, Lindell declared, stroking the lizard bird's skull. There's one thing I find troubling about all this, however. Numer is right. Wild magic does not function this way, as far as we can determine. What is the provenance of this power? Even the Black God is unable to give a semblance of life to the dead. Minos? suggested Kadar. No, he judges only. In the Echolatum Book of Tomes, it said the Queen of Chaos once raised an army of the dead, murmured Nomer. But the scrolls of Quay Ice Mage refute it, Lindell replied. According to him, the Queen of Chaos assembled dead wooden stones to be her army. No, the only god, I believe, who can resurrect that which was once flesh and is now dead is the graveyard hag. That's right, Kadar said. Remember? There are legends of bone dancers, the resurrected dead from the fall of the Achaean dynasty, and the end of the Almanot priest kings. He stopped, realizing what he was telling them, and the men looked at each other. Dane's throat locked as if a bony hand gripped it. Don't even think of it, dearie, a voice advised inside her head. It doesn't suit me that these handsome friends of yours should know I'm about. My, they're a tall set, aren't they? Not a one of them under six feet. I like these big fellows. Makes a girl feel sheltered and fragile, that's what I always say. You're as fragile as granite, thought the furious Dane. Of course, was the amused reply. I'm a goddess, after all, but it's nice to feel as if I might be fragile, old and rickety as I am. Now remember, I'm keeping an ear on you, so don't try to warn them. If you force me to silence you fast, I might hurt you. The hand on her throat squeezed, and Dane gasped, fighting for air. When her knees buckled, Numer caught her and held her to a seat. Are you all right? he asked, dark eyes worried. Bringing things to life tires you, doesn't it? She nodded. Kadar went into the other room and returned with a pitcher and a cup, which he filled and handed to her. Dane sipped. It was water, freshened with a leaf of mint. We have to be careful talking about the graveyard hag, he said, gently teasing. Yesterday she had a coughing fit in the hag's temple. It didn't let up until we were outside. Lindell frowned, troubled. Should you have visited her temple? We visited them all, said Kadar. It's my fault, Dane said, voice hoarse. I wanted to look at them. Uncle can't fault me for doing it when he told me to take her wherever she wanted. No, of course not. Lindell still looked uneasy. Clearly shaking it off, he said, Numer, I think you must be getting back. It's almost noon. And what will you young people do? I could have lunch brought to us and then show you around a bit. Dane smiled at the fair-haired man. I'd like that, if it's all right with Kadar. I can get to know your friends better. Lindell smiled as the lizard bird preened feathers that were long gone. Numer took a deep breath and began to shape change. Only when he was completely a hawk, oversized and black, did Lindell open a door so that he could fly into a garden and away. That night, Varys shifted the banquet to a series of broad, shallow terraces overlooking an ornamental lake. Dane and the prince were dinner partners once more, seated at the end of the main group. Herald was on Dane's other side. When the opening course was served, he amused himself by slipping tidbits to Kitten as he filled the two younger people in on the uneasy progress of the talks. The emperor hadn't even made an appearance at the talks that day. Duke Etiocrit, head of the Carthage negotiators, walked out after Duke Gareth said King Jonathan and Queen Theot would not agree to buy silk, dyes, and glass from no one but Carthic. Etiocrit returned, only to say that Carthic refused to surrender one of its lords, a pirate who often raided Tortal, to northern justice. When Harald turned to the woman seated on his other side, Dane, Col Dane told Kadar, It doesn't look at all good, does it? Do you see any happy faces around here? he asked, indicating to the servers that they would have the catfish. Dane shook her head. Nary a one. She leaned back and reshaped her ears, knowing the growing shadows would hide the change for most. Scraps of talk came to her and faded as she twitched them to and fro. I'm not going to let those things ruin his party, Numer. His Imperial Highness was simply in a mood. A will come to your people tomorrow, all smiles and conciliation. You just watch. 
Try the dormice, won't you? They're rolled in honey and poppy seeds. Dane winced. In her view, dormice were food for owls, cats, and snakes, and listened elsewhere. The result of a misunderstanding on my port, my dear Lord Martin. The Emperor has taken me sternly to task, and, I assure you, the progress of the talks in the morning will be far different. To honor her for her service to our treasured pets, Duke Gareth, surely your rules will not ask a penniless child to turn down a title and property of her own. Dane made a face. She wanted no lands or title from the Emperor Mage. With a sigh, she returned her ears to their normal shape and concentrated on the meal and her companions. As the sky darkened, they nibbled fried pockets of noodles and pork in a sweet sauce and talked about Kadar's mother and sisters. Kitten, thinking herself unobserved, gobbled Boar's tail with hot sauce, then had to leap for the water pitcher. Does she ever get sick from eating human food? Kadar watched as the dragon managed to dump half the water down her throat and half all over herself. Dane smiled. She never gets sick from anything. Once she ate a box of myrrh. She was only three months old. I thought every little accident she had would harm her for life. She didn't get sick? She burped smoke for a week, that's all. I should have a stomach like hers. Especially these days. Kadar's eyes flicked to where Ozorn sat, fanning himself idly. Come back with us, she said impulsively. Make a real life, one with no cages in it. His smile was both sad and bitter. I cannot. He's got my family, my friends, even my horse. Do you think he would stop at hurting them to bring me home? He patted her hand. No. Once he claims something, he never, ever lets it go. It's a miracle your Master Solomon has managed to remain free and unharmed all this time. Dane, knowing that Numer had worked as a street magician and nearly starved during his first years in Tortle, shook her head. Not daring to use his gift out of fear that Osorn would learn of it and hunt him down, changing his appearance and name, moving often before he made friends who brought him to the king's attention, to her that said he'd paid a high price for his miracle of survival. Dishes came and went until the meal was over at last. By then the light globes were burning, and musicians tuned their instruments at the far end of the terrace. Slaves arrived, pushing a large metal cart slowly down the line of tables. It bore an immense cake, the pinnacle of a pastry cook's art, shaped like the imperial palace down to each bay, ell, and tower. Looking at it, Dane now saw that the palace was built like a rising sun, a large half-circle with wings like short and long rays. The cooks made each piece and all the spun sugar, cream decorations, and so on, explained Kadar. But it's Varys who designs the cake and puts it together and supervises the decorating. Without her magic, they couldn't do anything so fancy. The guests applauded. Dane reluctantly clapped as well. Varys looked proud of herself as she offered the pastry knife to the Emperor. Osorn smiled and indicated that she should do the cutting. As the blonde turned to the cake, Dane realized that something was wrong with Kitten. The little dragon was clawing at her muzzle and rocking back and forth. Bending close, Dane could hear her squeak as if she were trying to talk with her jaws glued shut. Kit, what's the matter? She bent down to grab the dragon's forepaws. Your... Varys's shriek raised echoes on the lake. A slave filling Gareth the Younger's glass dropped his pitcher. It shattered on the flagstones. Dane jerked upright. Rats, mostly browns with a smattering of black ones, poured out of a hole in front of the cake in a stream, their numbers far greater than even this cake would hold. They tried to climb Varys' skirts as the blonde continued to scream. Alana was on her feet, groping for a sword she didn't wear. The mages were helpless, unable to throw fire at the animals without hurting Varys. Stop! Dane cried, running out from behind the table. The rats turned to stare at her. I said, stop! Opening herself up, she let her power flood out until it swamped them. In their minds, she read the knowledge that they were passing through a magical gate from their riverbank homes into the center of the confection. She also saw clearly the image of the graveyard hag in their thoughts, pointing them to the gate with her gnarled walking stick. Imperial Majesty! Someone cried, shaking Dane's concentration. The moment she faltered, the rats broke free. Six of them launched at her face. She slammed them with her power, killing three instantly. Two fled. One fastened his teeth in her sleeve. Coldly, Dane shook him off. The man who'd broken her concentration was still yelling. Majesty, even you can't continue to ignore the portents. You must... 
Alzorn pointed. Emerald fire lashed to wrap around the speaker, a Karthiki nobleman. Emerald flames leaped from his skin. He had time for one agonized shriek before the fire ate him up. Dane took a breath and renewed her magical grip on the rats, yanking them back from tables, and guess. They fought hard. She dug her nails into her palms, hunting for something to make her furious. She found it when she saw the ruin that had come to the cake Varys had worked so hard to create. Gathering up the anger she felt on the part of Varys, she turned it on the rats. "'We don't have to obey you,' snarled a brown. "'We don't owe you anything.' "'We serve a powerful mistress,' added someone else. "'Next to her, you are only a shadow.' She bore down, producing shrieks of rage and pain from them. "'Back into the cake, buckos,' she ordered, eyes glittering. "'Back where you came from. Do it now, before you really vex me.' They struggled wildly, but she had them. When she began to tighten the pressure, she felt their surrender like the buckling of a wall. She called silently, "'Tell your mistress, if she has a bone to pick with Osorn, pick it with him, not with them that have to obey him.' The rats leaped onto the cart and into the cake, vanishing through the gate. When the last of them had gone, the pastry collapsed. She looked around. Slaves propped up a fainting Varys. Numer climbed over his table. Giving his wakeflower vial to Harald and pointing to Varys, he came over to Dane. Are you all right? He cupped her cheek in one large hand, eyes worried. One of them bit you. She held up her arm to show him the rip in her sleeve and smiled. Didn't even nick the skin. It was only rats, Numer. He looked at the chaos around them. Slaves who had fled the rodents stayed in the shadows, afraid to come out. Duke Gareth and Duke Atiacrit were debating hotly in whispers as Gareth the Younger looked on. Her else was pulling the wake flower from under Varys's nose as she coughed and gasped. Alana talked softly into Kadar's ear. She had to stand on tiptoe to do it, and Kadar had to stoop a little. We need to get out of here before the sky starts raining blood or something equally pleasant, Numa remarked. Where's Osorn? The Emperor had left. The banquet was over. Varys, hysterical after she roused from her faint, was only able to cling to Numa and cry. All the guests, Karthiki and Foran alike, talked of the ominous signs they had seen and heard of intense, lowered voices. No one seemed to care if the Emperor spied on them or not. Dane and Kadar watched, quickly getting bored. It's not as if we can do anything about all this, complained the girl, cradling a dozing Zek. I get the feeling the only ones who can do something are your uncle and his ministers. Would you like to go for a walk, then? Kadar asked. Is there anything you'd like to do? Dane looked around. On the far side of the lake, behind the willows on its shore, she could sense the menagerie. Can we go look at the animals again? Let me ask. The prince went to talk briefly with Alana, who came back with him. I don't blame you for wanting to go someplace else, the lioness said with a glare at Varys. Just don't be gone too late. Tomorrow is another day. Provided it comes, of course. Dane stared at the champion. Do you know something we don't? Alana shook her head. Only that I didn't reach my station by ignoring the gods. If his imperial majesty doesn't consult them, soon, he will wish he had. Now scat, before I start crying. They scatted, passing a squad of guardsmen on their way around the lake. Kadar slowed and stared at them after they passed, his mouth tight. Then he shook his head and they walked on. On reaching the menagerie, he left her at the closed locked gate. When he returned, he bore a huge key ring. Sorting through the keys, he read their tags by the mage light he cast over their heads. What kind of gift do you have? Dane asked. Nobody ever said what you can do. Very little. He chose a key and fitted it in the lock. Call light, move things a short way, call fire. The gate swung open. What I do best is grow things. Trees, flowers, vegetables. I like to garden. The plants Lindell has for its creatures, I grew those. He closed the gate behind them. That's wonderful, Dane replied, opening herself to the captive animals. A shame you're stuck being a prince when you can do something important. Do those keys open the cages and enclosures? I want to go inside. Startled, he yelped, You want to... Remembering where they were, he finished in a rough whisper, What? Go in? Out of the question. Absolutely not. Don't be mythish, Kadar, she replied flatly. If you don't let me in proper, I'll ask Kin to do it, and maybe she'll melt the locks off. Kadar looked at the first enclosure, the lions. You swear you won't be harmed? 
Goddess, strike me if I lie, she said, holding up her right hand. Shaking his head, Kadar went to a door set into the wall next to the lion's pit, looking for the right key. Zek watched, fascinated. These key things, do they always open cages and doors? One of them is just called a key, replied Dane. Kadar glanced at her. Zek's asking, she explained. To the marmoset, she added, they open what doors and cages they're made to open. Two-leggers make locks to keep doors shut, unless you have the right key. It keeps folk from stealing what's ours. It also helps us keep prisoners. Then the key is magic, Zek said, gray-green eyes locked on Dane's face. If I'd had keys, I could have freed my little ones and my mate. Next time, I will have a key. Dane cuddled him. No one's ever going to cage you again, Zek. I promise. Gadar unlocked the door. Open it led to a small, dark stairwell that wound downward. Lights? asked the girl. Just snap your fingers. She made a face at him. I can't snap my fingers, your highness. You can't? Really? But it's easy. You just... I know what you just... I've been trying to for years. He grinned, teeth flashing against his dark skin. You don't know how much better that makes me feel. You can outshoot me and talk with animals, but you can't do this. Raising a hand, he snapped his fingers, and small light globes embedded in the wall flickered on. No need to rub it in, grumbled Dane. Kit, are you coming? The dragon went in, but Kadar hesitated. Maybe Zek would rather stay with me. I would, Zek told Dane, nostrils flaring as the scent of Big Cat rolled up the narrow stair. Dane handed him to the prince. Will I need keys down there? she asked. No, the inner doors are held by bolts. They aren't locked. May I see his keys? asked Zek. When Dane translated, the prince smiled and held the ring up for the marmoset to examine. Dane followed Kitten down the stairs and opened the door that took them into the lion's pit. The cats were awake. Moving to look at Dane, they caught a whiff of Kitten's alien scent and snarled. It's all right, Dane assured them, bathing the big animals in reassurance. She's a friend. I'd think, downwind of those immortals, that you'd be more open-minded. There was a laugh from above. She looked up and saw Kadar leaning on the rail. Is that what upset them? She smiled crookedly. You'd think they never smelled a dragon before, she joked, holding her hands out for the lions to smell. Entering their minds, she could feel they missed open ranges, even the ones who were bred in captivity, who learned of their true wildlife from the others. That had bothered her from the first. The sadness of their days, even in confinement as pleasant as this. She could not turn them loose. Even if she could, they would be hunted down. Now at least she could do something for them. Lindell had given her the idea when he showed her the small worlds he'd fashioned for his friends. She asked the cat's permission first. They gave it. Starting with those born wild, she used their memories to build a waking dream. From different parts of their minds, she drew scents, images, sounds until she felt as if she'd been transported to a hot, distant land. She gave the dream shape with the chill of winter rains, air perfumed with dry grass, zebra dung, fresh blood, the grunts and lowing of herds of fat prey. Carefully she sewed the dream in each lion, rooting it firmly in their minds. Now when they chose, all they had to do was shut their eyes and remember. The dream would awaken. They would be home and free. With Kitten, she climbed back up the stair and went to the chimpanzee enclosure. Kadar moved away from her as she passed, and looked at her with awe as he unlocked the chimp's prison. One by one, she visited all the menagerie captives. Dream planning wasn't physically hard, but it was time-consuming. Kitten grew bored and joined Kadar and Zek. The prince, to his credit, never complained about how long this took. At last, she reached the hyena enclosure. All three inhabitants sat at the bottom of the glass-like wall, Dark eyes up and watching, rounded ears pricked forward. Perhaps you should pass by these, Kadar suggested. She stared at him. Goddess bless, why? They're not like other animals, Dane. They're cowards. If an animal fights them, they run away. They steal kills from lions, cheetahs. They even devour their young. She scratched her head. For some reason, what he said irritated her. Steal kills, is it? Doesn't Karthak do the same? Karthak has eaten all her young. Siraj, Echolotum, Amar, Apal, Zalara, Shusin, 
even Yamut, all the way to the foot of the roof of the world. She stiffened up, offended. Forgive me for speaking so plain, but you do make them sound like this country of yours. I'm sorry to be rude when you've been kind to me, but animals at least do everything for a good reason, to eat, to survive. His smile would have gone unnoticed if she hadn't given herself cat eyes to see into the shadows around them. It was sour, but it was a smile. You just reminded me that hyenas are sacred to our patron goddess. You know, the graveyard hag. How delightful for them, she replied, also sour. Will you let me in there or not? He shrugged and opened the door that would admit her to the stair down. Once she emerged into their pit, the hyenas surrounded her, sniffing eagerly. So you came back after all, remarked their leader, the female. I am to you. Me, my boys. Aran is the one with the nicked ear. Irie has more spots than he can use. Dane smiled, running her hands over powerful shoulders, exploring the muscles under the hyena's rough and wiry fur. I'm honored to meet you. All of you. Too bad you weren't here before, Tiu said, touching Dane's closed eyes with her cold nose. This close, the reek of mush and dead meat made it hard for the girl to breathe. The hungry one was here. This time, he wasn't just hungry. He was scared. It's the best we ever smelled him. What hungry one? she asked, curious. The hungry one, said to you, sniffing Dane from top to toe. The one who wants to eat the world. He hates us, but he can't stay away. And tonight, he was so afraid. How do you know? We smell it, Irie's voice murmured. We can smell him quite well when he stands up there. May I? Dane asked to you. The female let her into her mind to experience the world as they did. Kadar was partly right when he spoke of hyena nature. Tiu had killed her twin not long after they were born. It was hyena custom. In some ways they thought like a wolf pack, but their noses were ten times better than even a wolf's. They mapped their landscape with scent as a bat would map it with sound. She breathed with Tiu and learned. The wind brought a bouquet of odor to the nose, one the hyena sorted through for her. She smelled Kadar. Lavender from his clothes, his own unique personal smell, each food he consumed that night. Kitten scent was completely alien, even to one who lived on the other side of the wall from the Immortals' menagerie. Tiu savored it, making sure it would never be forgotten, before she turned to Zek. His odor was musky, touched with hints of the fruits he loved, and mixed with the fear he felt as the hyena's smell reached him. What about the hungry one? she asked Tiu. The hyena's memory for scent was as vivid as Dane's for sights. Their hungry one smelled of expensive cloth, soaps and hair oils, amber and cinnamon, spicy food and wine. The girl was startled to recognize it, though her memory of that particular odor was far less strong than to use. Leaving the hyena's mind, she comforted Zek briefly. When he was calm, she called up to the prince, Kadar, why is your uncle afraid of the hyenas? The prince leaned over the wall to look down at her. Who told you that? Dane rested a hand on Aran's sloping shoulder. They did. They smell it on him. Kadar, I swear these creatures can smell anything. Kadar fingered his eardrop. Kitten, is there a listening spell on us? The dragon whistled. The sounds produced flares from Kadar's gems, nothing else. Thank you. Whenever you wish, you may live with me. Lowering his voice, he told Dane, When Uncle took the throne... A prophecy was made that hyenas would lead his doom to him. If Chioke hadn't reminded him the hyenas are sacred to the graveyard hag, he would have killed everyone in the Empire. Instead, he keeps these. We have a saying about things like that, buying off the grave diggers. He lifted his head. What was that? She gave her ears bat shape and listened. There are humans in the Immortals Menagerie. No one can go there without my uncle's permission. Kadar examined the keys. I should check. Can't we leave it be? No. Do you know the magic that can be done with Griffin's blood or Spidrin wool? If you want to wait, fine. She looked at her new friends. Do you want the waking dream? The one I gave the others? To you yipped her amusement. We would rather have what is here, she replied. The smells in this place are much more interesting than the ones at home. She left them, racing up the stairs to the main walk. Kadar was quietly trying to fit keys into the special menagerie's lock. When she joined him, he was scowling. Splendid, he muttered. 
The guards have a way in at the back of the Immortal's enclosure, but I don't want to go past them. I'd hoped I'd find a normal lock, one for the cleaning slaves, but there isn't one. This lock is magical, and my gift won't open it. I don't know if the underground tunnels come out this far, either. She heard voices on the far side of the gate. Are you sure this is needful? A drop of saliva from a flesh-eating unicorn in a man's food will kill him after three days of intense pain. It's undetectable as a poison, unless you know exactly what to look for. Dane sighed. I suppose that means yes. Kitten, don't melt it. Just open it. The dragon sniffed the keyhole. Backing up a few steps, she gave a demanding whistle, and the gate swung open. Kadar strode past Dane. Zack, on his shoulder, leaped into the girl's arms, and she and Kitten followed.